Okay, so let's get started. Um, welcome back. It's been, a, it's been a week already. So, um, I, would, I was in Cincinnati over the weekend, and I thought I dodged the bullet. You know, just after I left, I got a big dump of snow there. But, um, but then uh, we're gonna get some snow tonight as well. So, okay, I didn't really completely <laughs> dodge the bullet. But it's good to be back. Um, so before I begin, um, just a little bit of an announcement is that I haven't done this yet, but your first homework set will be posted, um, you know, f for Friday, and then you're going to have, um, d depending on, I, I think I have um, like six or seven problems for that, so, you know, I will give you two weeks to work on that. Um, so the homework, you know, as I explained at the very beginning, will be sort of every other week kind of thing. So, you know, you, you would be, um, be given homework in two weeks, every other week, and then have two weeks to finish. Okay? All right, so this is the fun part. Um, this is the challenging part. Um, this is the very crude, <laughs> rather crude, but I think hopefully intuitive version of Introduction to Quantum Mechanics and Solid State Physics. So here we go. So, so wh why are we doing this? Okay, so the the reason that we're doing this is to understand what semiconductor really is and why semiconductor is important and interesting. That's sort of the, the, uh, the, the uh, under that, the, that's the kind of understanding that we're trying to accomplish here, okay? So, to understand what semiconductor is, you have to start with an atom, right? So, there is a guy named Bohr, he's a German physicist back in the 30s, and he came up with this, this idea of an of, uh, a, a atom, okay? And he, his idea of atom is, okay, so there is a very heavy nucleus, and then there is an electron floating around, orbiting around it, okay? So nucleus is a positively charged particle, very, very heavy, at least a thousand times, and if not more, heavier than the electron. Electron is a very light, small particle, negatively charged, orbiting around. So that's Bohr's mo uh, model. And this is the, you know, the time that the quantum mechanics is, uh, is, is first being developed. And in quantum mechanics, electron is not a particle. So electron is a, is a wave. Everything is a wave. All right, so the, the, here is the dilemma. People used to think the electron is a particle, but with the birth of quantum mechanics, Bohr knew that electron is actually a wave, All right? But the trouble is, wave is not something that you can confine it into a tight little space, okay? Wave, if you throw a stone onto a pond, wave is something that propagates away. Right? You can't really, when I, when I speak, you know, the, the vibrational wave that was generated in my mouth, you know, propagates into the room so that you can, you can hear me, right? So wave is not something that's localized. Particle is something that's localized. But we do know that there is an atom, and the size of this atom is about half a nanometer. Very, very, very small. Electron is there. We know that. Right? Otherwise, there won't be an atom. So how is it possible that the wave, electronic wave, doesn't propagate away from the atom and just stay there in such a tight little space? Right? And there is only one kind of wave that doesn't propagate away, that just stays there. And then that's the standing wave. And here is the uh, example of a standing wave, it's a guitar string. When you, when you, when you strum your guitar string, ex ex excite these wave, these forward propagating wave versus, and, and the wave is, the vibrational wave is going to for, uh, propagate to the left first, and then it's going to bounce off, reflect off of the edge, comes back, and it's going to propagate to the right, and then it's going to bounce off of the, uh, the, the other side. And the interference between these forward and backward propagating wave will kill each other in general, will destructively interfere and disappear in general. Except your wavelength is a perfect fit to the length, this length. So if 
half wavelength, as shown here, half wavelength, in, uh, if the integer multiple of half wavelengths is equal to the length of this entire string, okay? Then the forward and backward propagating wave adds up and create a standing wave, right? So this is a standing wave. That's the only wave. It just, it just vibrates uh, up and down and doesn't go anywhere. It just stays there. So the Bohr's idea then is, okay, electron must form a standing wave around the nucleus, okay? And that's, that looks like this, right? So electron orbits around, but electronic wave forms a standing wave around this spherical orbit, okay? Bohr's uh, idea has, has a spherical orbit. So what does that imply then? It implies that electrons' wavelength, right, these wavelength of the electronic wave cannot be anything. It can be only uh, a certain discrete numbers that fit this orbit perfectly. Otherwise, they're not going to form standing wave and they're just dissipate away, right? So, only a discrete set of electronic waves are allowed, uh, wavelengths are allowed, only a discrete set of, of energy, therefore, you know, this wavelength of the electronic wave is related to electrons' energy. So only a certain discrete set of energies are allowed, okay? In other words, electrons just cannot get any kind of energy, but their energy levels are quantized. Hence the name quantum mechanics, right? So that's the birth of the quantum mechanics, right? And the corollary to that is that the angular momentum of the electron is also quantized. So the, here is the birth of the quantum mechanics and the quantum mechanical description of an atom, all right? So it, these, um, these Bohr's model predicts discrete energy level. That's what's important here. That's the takeaway, all right? Discrete uh, energy levels, allowed energy levels for electrons, okay? So not all energies are allowed. Now, let's make a molecule, okay? So we're, 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 we're eventually go to silicon, but so let's start with the simplest possible molecule, which is a diatomic molecule, two atoms, okay? Two hydrogen atoms, smallest atom, right? If you bring them together, right? So these individual, here is the individual, um, hydrogen atom, okay, has one proton and one electron orbiting around it, and their wave function sort of, you know, kind of looks like this, right? Okay, so the, um, it sort of has the highest amplitudes near the uh, position of the proton and sort of decays, exponentially decays away. That's the general shape, you know, as a function of R, all right, the, the radial coordinate. That's the general shape of the electron, electronic wave. Okay, now if you bring these two guys together, okay, then if they're, if they're far apart, then they're just atom, and, and you know, they're described by the Bohr's, atom, uh, Bohr's uh, model very well, but when you bring them close together, then this electron here is going to feel the attraction by this guy, okay, this electron here is going to feel the attraction by this guy, okay. So, they, when, when that electrostatic interaction from the other atom, uh, from the proton of the other atom becomes appreciable, then they, be, they form molecule, okay? Now, then, because you now have two protons, the condition for standing waves are different, all right? So, you have to now form a standing wave around two protons instead of just one. So standing wave condition will be different and they will form a standing wave for this molecule instead of just the one isolated atom, right? Now, what are those standing waves then? That's the big question. And people found out that you can construct these new waves, new electronic waves for the molecule from 
the atomic, uh, atomic uh, waves, atomic orbitals, right? So you start with the individual atomic wave function, this and this. You bring them close together, and then they form either a symmetric combination as shown here, or anti-symmetric combination there. Okay, so these are the two standing waves that you can form from the, uh, using these individual atomic wave functions. Okay, and um, so this symmetric combination is called the bonding uh, orbital, and the anti-symmetric waves are called the anti-bonding molecular orbital. Okay, so and and um, I'll, I'll explain that to you in just a minute. Okay, so that's what I said. That's what I said. Okay, so why, why, why is this guy, symmetric one is called the bonding orbital, and why, why the other one is called the anti-bonding orbital? To explain this, I need to tell you a little bit about what we mean by electronic wave, okay? So in quantum mechanics, these electronic wave actually represents probability of finding an electron at a certain position. That's the physical meaning. You know, what is the amplitude of this wave function at a certain position here? Well, that amplitude represents the, what, well, to be exact, the amplitude squared represents the probability of finding an electron that position, right? So, in bonding orbital, you have a, a reasonably high amplitude of the wave function in the middle, in between the two protons, meaning that there's a great, uh, there's a high probability of finding these two electrons in between the two protons, okay? So, if you look at the Coulomb energy, Coulomb st electrostatic energy, the energy is small if positively charged particle and negatively charged particle are close together. When they are far apart, the potential energy is high, okay? When they are close, energy is low. So, these guys, will generally have a lower energy, be simply because on average, you can tell the electrons um, and the protons are close. Electrons are sitting in between the two protons. As opposed to these anti-bonding case where the probability is generally very low in between region and exactly zero at the right middle, in, 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 in the middle, okay? And, and relatively speaking, the amplitude of the wave function on the outside is high, all right? So what does that mean? That means in the anti-bonding state, anti-bonding molecular orbital, electrons are likely to sit outside of the two protons, which means that they're generally, you know, farther apart, farther away from the positively charged, and that represents a higher energy, higher Coulomb energy, right? So this bonding, um, orbital represents a lower energy state, and the anti-bonding orbital represents the higher energy state. So, what have we done here? By having, uh, by bringing two atoms close together, right, we create two energy levels, right? So, so this happens for each atomic energy level. In the atom, single atom, you have discrete set of energy levels, right? and then you bring two atoms close together, each of these discrete set of ato uh, atomic energy levels split into two. One lower energy state, bonding orbital, representing the symmetric combination, and the other higher energy anti-bonding orbital, which represents the anti-symmetric combination of those two uh, atomic orbitals that you're mixing. This happens at every energy levels of the individual atom. All right, now, this is the um, energy level diagram here. So, this is the uh, 1s energy level. This is the lowest energy level of hydrogen atom, okay? And hydrogen atom in its lowest state, in its stable, most stable state, has one electron in the lowest possible energy state, obviously, right? So, it has one electron there. Another hydrogen atom, one electron in the lowest possible energy state. You bring these two hydrogen atoms close together, then 
these two atomic orbitals form bonding and anti-bonding orbitals. All right? Now, now you have two electrons, right? One from each atom. So, the, and these electrons would like to go to the lowest possible energy state. Okay, that's the most energetically most stable state. So, both of these two electrons would like to go to the lowest possible energy state. Okay, so what have happened? By forming a molecule, you have actually reduced the total energy of the system. Two isolated atoms have higher energy than one molecule. Right? This is why hydrogen is like uh, hydrogen forms diatomic gas, hydrogen gas. If you purchase, you can, you can buy hydrogen gas, and if you purchase your hydrogen gas, you will get always H2 gas. Hydrogen exists, you know, predominantly in nature in the form of diatomic molecule, H2 molecule. And why? Because of this, because forming hydrogen at, uh, forming hydrogen molecule, H2 molecule, saves energy. It's more energetically stable. They would like to do that. Okay? Now, let's do it. Let's do it with helium. Okay? It's the next atom in the periodic table, second smallest atom. It has two electrons and two protons, and, and two neutrons, of course, too. Um, so so these, these helium does the same thing. If you bring two helium atoms close together, right, then they form bonding orbital and anti-bonding orbital as well. Right? And now the, the, you, you populate these, um, these atomic orbitals, so you have a total of four electrons, two from each helium atoms. Now you bring, they would like to go to the lowest possible energy state as well. However, there is a thing called Pauli's exclusion principle, and that says that, oh, I'm sorry, you can have at most two electrons per energy level. You can't accommodate more electrons. So only two electrons can, can occupy the lower energy bonding orbital, and the other two will have to go up. Okay? No vacancy in the lowest energy level. You have to go up, upstairs. All right? So... What have, what have we done here? Two, and two of the electrons have lowered their energy, but two other electrons have actually have raised their energy. Overall, there is no gain. You didn't, you, you didn't um, gain in terms of energy. You didn't lower the total system energy by forming He2 molecule, helium-2 molecule. Right? So there is no point in doing that. Helium, therefore, does not form diatomic molecule. Helium gas is an atomic gas. It's just single helium atom. It's stable by itself, and if they form gas, okay. So if you go to Safeway and buy this balloon, okay, these these you know, happy birthday balloon, you know these these uh, uh, are filled with helium gas. You know, it's the thing that when you breathe in, it it makes you sound funny. That's the gas. That gas is not a molecular gas. It's an atomic gas. Okay? The reason that helium exists in the form of atomic gas is because of what I just explained. There is no energy gain by forming molecule. Therefore, they exist in atomic gas. All right. Now, lithium. So, the next element in our periodic table is lithium, okay? Atomic number three. So it has three electrons. So these are the energy levels, atomic energy levels. There is the lowest energy level, there is the second lowest, and then on and on and on, and, and it goes on, okay? So these are the atomic energy levels of, of lithium. Lithium has three electrons, so two electrons goes to the lowest possible energy state. Right? And Pauli's exclusion principle once again says that, okay, that's it. The third electron will have to go up here. Okay, next. And this highest energy electron in an atom, we call that valence electron. This is the one that makes the interesting thing. This is the one. These, are, these valence electrons are the ones that, that form, you know, chemical bonding and, you know, all that stuff. 
right? These, these lower energy electrons are called the core electrons, and their energy is so low, you know, so low that they don't want to do anything. So they're very inert. They don't participate in chemical bonding. You know, they don't form, you know, bonding and anti-bonding orbitals and stuff like that. All right. Or, or they, they do, but, but the, the, you know, as you can see, the energy level splitting occurs at extremely strong interaction. You know, if, if you, you have to almost fuse the atoms together in order to see these formation of bonding and anti-bonding orbitals for those core electrons. So, for all practical purposes, we can ignore core electrons and only deal with a valence electron, this guy, okay? So, now, when you bring two lithium atoms, okay, these valence electron energy level will split into two, right? Bonding and anti-bonding. What about if you bring, what about when you bring in three lithium atoms? Then what happens? Well, then the energy level will split into three. Four lithium atoms energy level split into four. 10 to the 22 lithium atoms, energy level will split into 10 to the 22 different energy levels. Okay, and that's what's shown here. Okay, so the x-axis here is the interatomic spacing. How close these uh, neighboring lithium ions are. Okay, when they are very, very close together, then the interaction between atoms will be much stronger. When they're far apart, the interaction between adjacent atoms will be weak. They, they resemble more isolated atoms. Okay? And as they bring close together, they, they become solid. They become, you know, more in, entangled system, if you will. So at, so, at infinite distance, you have isolated atom. As you bring the atoms close together, these energy levels will split as you've seen here, into 10 to the 22. That's the number of atoms in, in solid, you know. The atomic density in solid is 10 to, the, 10 to the 22, 10 to the 23 atoms per cubic centimeters. That's a typical density, right? So that's the kind of atoms, um, uh, uh, the number of atoms that we're dealing with and therefore the number of energy levels that we are dealing with, right? So this splitting will, will, will continue, right, as you bring the atoms closer together, closer, closer, closer together. But at some point, they're too close. When they're too close, Pauli's exclusion principle once again dictates they don't like to be too close together. You know, electrons are negatively charged particles, and negatively charged particles repel each other, right? They don't like to be get too close to, the, um, to another negatively charged particle. That's the electrostatic repulsion. And if you force it even closer, then Pauli's exclusion principle says that, you know, you, I'm not, you, you, you can't make two particles to overlap. You just can't, right? So, so that's why energy goes up again. If, if you force the atoms too close together, energy goes up again. Okay? They don't like it. So there is a sweet spot. Okay, there is a certain interatomic distance where the overall energy is minimized. Okay? And that distance is the lattice constant of your crystal. Okay? And that distance in, in most crystals typically about five angstroms, half a nanometer ish. Okay? And it, it obviously depends on, on the exact type of solid, exact type of atoms that you're dealing with. But, but that's what happens. So, so now let's look at the energy level diagram at this particular interatomic spacing, interatomic distance, the, the optimal distance. Now you have how many energy levels? The energy, number of energy levels here, the split energy levels, right, so let me, so number of split energy level, uh, number of split energy levels here is equal to the number of atoms, right? And each atom brings one electron, one valence electron, right? And 
each energy level can accommodate up to two electrons. So now electrons like to go to the lowest possible energy state, and it starts filling the energy level from the bottom. Right? Then how much would you fill it up? Halfway. Right? The total number of electrons is equal to the number of atoms. Total number of energy levels also equal to the number of atoms. Each energy level accommodates two electrons, so electrons pile up up to exactly halfway. Right? So, what do we have here? We have 10 to the 22 energy levels packed in the energy range, energy typ typical range of energy, you know, here. From, he, from here to here is at most several electron volt okay in most solid in that range of energy you pack in 10 to the 22 10 to the 23 energy levels so you can think of it the individual the the uh, difference between the adjacent energy level will be tiny you know 10 to the negative 22 electron volt something like that very very small for all practical purpose, you can consider this as a continuous, continuous range of allowed energy. Okay? That continuous, continuous range of allowed energy is called energy band. Okay? So this is the key difference. In atoms and molecules, electrons' energies are discrete. There are only a certain well-defined energies allowed. This energy is allowed, this energy is allowed, this energy is allowed, and so on and so forth. Atoms and molecules, electronic energy, uh, energy levels form a discrete set. But in solid, you have a continuous range of energy that are allowed. This continuous range of allowed energy is called energy band. Right? So in lithium, you have this energy band right here, and that energy band in the lowest possible energy state at zero Kelvin, okay? Ground state configuration, that energy band is filled halfway, filled with electron halfway. And the upper half is empty, okay? So materials with this partially filled energy band is called metal, and they are good conductors. And I, I'll explain to you later why that is. Okay. Now look at silicon. Okay, silicon is a little different. Okay, because a silicon has four electrons in the valence uh, in the valence shell. The the highest energy electrons in silicon atom. There are four. Okay, and the highest. The, the valence shell, valence electrons um, in, in, um, in silicon atom are separated, are distributed over two separate energy levels, 3s and 3p. These are just the labels. If you're not familiar with it, that's okay. Just consider that there are two electrons, two, two electrons here, two, two electrons there, per atom. Okay? So you start two down there, two up there, and then as you bring the silicon atoms close together, these guys will split as well to the number of silicon atoms. Right? So this energy level splits like this, and this energy level splits like that. But these two guys then overlap. Okay? This thing is going to go up like this, and, and this thing is going to go up like this, and then there is an overlap region right there, okay? And they don't like to overlap. <laughs> so energy levels in quantum mechanics, this is a very fundamental phenomenon, it's a very interesting phenomenon called anti-crossing. Energy levels don't like to mix. mix. They, when two energy levels come down like this, they don't cross. They, they anti-cross, so they, they avoid each other, okay? <laughs> they repel each other. So that's what happens here. So what you end up with is two energy bands, one down here, one up there. In the middle, you have an energy gap. 
there is a region of energy where there are no allowed energy levels. We call that energy band gap. Okay? So the, the band structure, energy band structure of silicon is as opposed to lithium. Lithium has just one continuous band and the electron is partially filled. In silicon, you have two bands. Two bands, one lower band, lower energy band, one higher energy band, separated by gap, energy band gap. Okay, so that's the silicon um, uh, energy band diagram. And in the in the lowest energy state, all electrons are are down here. This lower band are completely full. And the upper band, this band up here is completely empty. That's the zero Kelvin, zero, temp zero Kelvin temperature, lowest possible energy configuration for silicon. Okay? So, so materials that have this type of energy band structure and electronic configurations are called insulator. Okay? And they don't conduct electricity. Um, let's see. Okay, so um, so the, these are uh, the some examples of real energy band structure of selected semiconductor: germanium, silicon, and gallium arsenide. So this is germanium, silicon, gallium arsenide. X-axis here is the uh, wave vector, wave wave vector for electronic wave, and y-axis is energy. So um, don't worry too much about the wave vector stuff. It's just, you know, some way to characterize a wave. Um, but the point is that there is a band gap right here, okay? And above the band gap, you have all these things, okay? And they form conduction band. These, this is the band that exists above the band gap. We call that conduction band, okay? And all, all these guys here, down here, form the valence band. This is the energy band below the band gap. Okay, so we call that valence band. Um, and at zero temperature, all electrons are down here. And nothing is up here. Okay, that's, the ger that's germanium. Same thing for electrons. There is a band gap. Above the band gap, you have conduction band. Below the band gap, you have um, a valence band. Same thing for gallium arsenide. There is the band gap below valence band, above conduction band. Okay, so all semiconductors have the same band structure, basically. Band gap in the middle, conduction band on top, valence band the bottom. Okay. So the, these distinctions. Some materials have band gap that separates conduction and valence band. Some other materials like lithium does not have band gap. They do not have, a band, ha have any band gaps. They have just one continuous energy bands, and then electrons are, are, are uh, the, those bands are partially filled, half full with electrons. Okay? These are the critical distinction between um, metal and, and insulator. Okay? So, so, so here, this one is called the density of states, the number of energy levels. How many energy levels do you have? That's density of state. Okay? Um, and I'll come back to that later again. Um, so it just represents the number of energy levels. So for a semiconductor, you have a band gap where the density of state is zero. Number of energy level is zero. There are no energy levels. And then you have conduction band and valence band. At zero Kelvin, all occupied nothing here okay and this is this is insulator and this is metal B is metal you have you don't have band gap you have just one continuous you know band and it's partially filled this is metal okay <coughs> um, okay so is the band gap what makes the semiconductor or insulator unique? Um, you know, yes, but not entirely. Okay. So, 
the before we discuss semiconductor, the uh, solids, you know, solids in general, are classified into two classes depending on their electrical conduction properties. There are good conductors and there are bad conductors, insulators. Okay, so you could be metal or you could be an insulator. Okay, so these are the two very large high level classification of solids, okay, metals and insulators. And the, um, what distinguishes metal and insulator is not necessarily existence, mere existence of van gap, but the fact that at zero Kelvin, at temperature zero, okay, you have valence band completely full and conduction band completely empty. Okay? In that case, in that case, all your energy bands are either completely empty or completely full. Okay? That's insulator. What is metal then? What is a conductor then? Well, conductor is at zero Kelvin, at, at the lowest possible energy configuration, you have at least one partially filled band. Okay? And, you know, you may have a band gap way up there, you may have a band gap way down there, it doesn't really matter. Okay? A metal is, it, some metals do have a band gap, but at some, you know, very non-relevant energy range. Whether or not there is a band gap, metal always have one, at least one, partially filled energy band at zero Kelvin. That's metal. Okay? So why is that important? Why is that important? Here is the nice analogy. Okay? So suppose you have a water bottle, and your water bottle is partially filled, partially filled with water, okay? as shown here. And now you tilt it. When you tilt the water bottle, then the gravity pulls the water molecules, and there is a flow. The water molecules flow. Okay? There is a net flow of water molecules. Okay? This tilting is equivalent of applying electric field. Okay? And if, if your energy bands are partially filled, then the electrons can flow. And the electrons flow, that's electric, uh, the electrical conduction. So if you have a partially filled band, at least one partially filled band, then you have electrical conduction. Then you have a conductor. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you have a completely full bottle, water bottle, even if you tilt it, there is no net flow of water molecules because there is no place to go. The, the bottle is completely full. There, there are no space, empty space, for the water molecules to flow to. So there is no uh, flow. So if you have a completely full band, then even, even if you apply electric field, there is no electrical electron flow because there are no empty states. Right? If you have a completely empty bottle, then, oh, duh, there is no flow because there is no water molecule. Right? So if your energy band is completely empty, there are no electrons, then obviously there will be no electrical conduction even as you apply electric field. Right? So, Insulator is insulating because they have, they only have either completely full band or completely empty bands. They can't conduct. Metals are good conductors because they have at least one partially filled band. These partially filled electrons in the partially filled bands are the ones that, that produces a net flow, therefore electrical conduction. Okay? Now, so you now know the distinction between insulator and conductor. Then what is a semiconductor? Well, semiconductor is a special kind of an insulator whose energy band gap is small. Okay? And, and the, the good question is then, how small is small? Okay. Well, small, there is no scientific definition of how small you have to be, your band gap has to be, to be a semiconductor. It's just all empirical, conventional 
um, some, to some people, you know, three electron volt is high. To some people, it's not high. Uh, you, you know, so so depends on who you ask. But in general, okay, in general, two to three electron volt of energy band gap qualifies you as semiconductor. If your band gap energy is greater than that, um, it, it, it is generally considered insulator. Okay, I'll give you some examples. In, examples of insulator first. Okay, the uh, silicon dioxide. Okay, silica, and it's it's used for you know in semiconductor devices as an insulator a lot. You know these guys have a band gap of about seven to eight electron volt. Okay, it's very very high. It's a good insulator, but what's a semiconductor then? Okay. So there are indium antimonide, this guy, indium antimonide and germanium. These guys are called the so-called narrow band gap semiconductors. These are among the semiconductors that have small band gap. And these guys have 0.16 electron volt and 0.67 electron volt energy band gap. That's considered small. Okay? So these guys are very metallic. Right? If you look at their electrical properties, they resemble metal. They are still semiconductors, but they, they behave more like metal because their band gap is very small. And then there is this most popular and most widely used semiconductor, and that's silicon and gallium arsenide. And these guys have a band gap of about 1 eV, a little over 1 eV, 1 electron volt. Okay. And then there is a wide band gap semiconductor. Gallium phosphide has 2.2 eV. Gallium nitride has 3.5 eV. Zinc sulfide, 3.6, 3.7 electron volt. There is a zinc selenide, which has a slightly smaller band gap, um, you know, 2.7, 2.8 electron volt. These guys are called wide band gap semiconductors. All right. If you look at these wide band gap semiconductors, they behave, you know, more like insulators. So there's a varying degree of conductivity or uh, conduction properties that, that, that you may find in semiconductors depending on their band gap energy. Okay? So what is the rigorous definition of semiconductor? We would like to have a rigorous scientific definition, and that's this. Okay? Semiconductor is a solid which is an insulator at zero Kelvin. It is an insulator by definition. But it is an insulator whose energy band gap is small enough that at room temperature, if you increase the temperature, there is a substantial increase in conductivity. Okay? Why, why, does, it, uh, exhibit, uh, why, why does it exhibit increased conductivity with increasing temperature? Because the band gap energy is small enough so that some of these electrons at the top of the valence band can jump across the band gap and show up in the conduction band. Okay? You can do that if the band gap energy is small enough and if your temperature is high enough. Right? Thermal energy is large enough. Then, when that happens, what, hap what did you do? You created two partially filled bands. Your conduction band is now partially filled. You have some electrons there. And your valence band is also partially filled. You have created some empty states at the top. So semiconductors can exhibit conduction, electrical conduction, by conduction electrons, conduction band electrons, or valence band electrons, or both. And you will see that a lot of the semiconductor devices have conduction through both bands. And this type of device is called bipolar device. Okay? Have you heard of bipolar junction transistor? You know, the name bipolar come from, you know, not mental condition, from this, right? So this, it, it has two polarities. One arising from the conduction band electron, and the other from the valence band electrons. 
Okay? But if the band gap is really, really high, band gap is very, very large. And it's large compared to what? Compared to the thermal energy, the temperature. Then not many electrons can jump across the band gap. And they just remain in the valence band. And these guys are good insulators. OK? So all right, I have five more minutes left. All right. Now, let, let me introduce the concept of holes. Okay? So the electrical current is due to the movement of charge. Okay? And, and there are particles that carry charge, like electrons. And we call that charge carriers. Okay? So the electrical current is due to the movement of charge carriers. And by definition, the current, the J is the current density, so the current per unit area, okay, is the charge that each particle carries times its velocity. Okay? And then you add them up for all particles, all charge carriers in your system, and that gives you the charge density. Uh, uh, current density, I'm sorry. Current density. Okay? So now, as I said, semiconductors have two partially filled bands, okay? Conduction band and valence band. So conduction band uh, electrons, the, the current, current density arising from the movement of conduction band electrons are simply given by this. This is just a rewrite of this equation, you know. So the, each electron carries a charge of negative Q. Here, Q is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th Coulomb, okay, electronic charge. It's negatively charged, so negative Q, times the velocity of electron, the velocity of that particular electron, and you sum over all electrons in the conduction band. Then, you have the current density due to conduction band electrons. Okay, there you go. No sweat. But what about valence band? Valence band, you should do the same. You should do the same. The valence band cur uh, current density is basically summation of all electrons in the valence band. Okay, uh, you know negative Q times V sub I of the velocity of electrons is sum it over all electrons in the valence band. Okay? Trouble is, there are a lot of electrons in the valence band. The summation for conduction band was not that difficult because the number of electrons in the conduction band is relatively small. But number of electrons of valence band, big. You know, valence band is nearly full <coughs> and only small, you know, empty states near the top, right? So if you want to sum over all the electrons, that's, that's a big sum, big summation. Mathematically, you know, we don't want to do that. <clears throat> so, why don't we do this? Well, instead of summing over all electrons in the valence band, let's count only the empty states, only the small number of empty states at the top. Okay? So, the current density due to the valence band electrons is, by definition, is just, oops, whoa, okay. I don't know what, what I did. All right. Uh, ah, OK. So the current density due to the valence band is, again, negative Q times the velocity summed over all electrons, filled states. OK, but we can rewrite this sum as this. You do the summation for all states, entire valence band, minus sum over empty states. Okay? But what did I tell you about the conduction by the completely full band? There is no conduction. Zero. This is zero. You're only left with this guy. Now, there is a negative sign here. Therefore, the charge Q changes the sign, right? And we sum over only the empty states. What are we doing here? We are treating these empty states as if it is a positively charged particle. Okay? 
and that positively charged particle is called holes, okay? And it's very, very important to understand that this is not a real particle. There is no real positively charged particle in your semiconductor. They are all electrons. But holes are fictitious particle. It's a concept that makes our numerical calculations much more manageable. Okay? So we pretend that there actually exists a positively charged particle in the valence band that conducts. Although the physical entity, the real physical entity that, that conducts are still electrons. Okay? So, from now on, the convention is, when I say electron, I mean electrons in the conduction band. Okay? And when I say holes, I mean the empty states in the valence band. Okay? So that will be the convention. That will be the typical language used in semiconductor literature, and we'll follow that. Okay, so um, I'll stop here. I ran out of time. Um, so I'll continue on, um, discuss the effective mass, um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and then we jump into the actual conduction um, in semiconductor. What are the current, you know, uh, current, uh, what are the mechanisms for electrical current in semiconductor? There are two, you know, possible current mechanisms in semiconductors, and you know, we, we, dis we developed a, a fundamental description of that, okay? And then at that point, once we finish that, then we are ready to discuss our first device, which will be uh, a uh, PN junction, okay? So uh, let me stop here, and I'll see you again on Friday. And as advertised, uh, you will have a first homework set posted on the website on Friday.